Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the concluding event in the NYU Reynolds Program's 2009-2010 Social Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century Speaker Series. Reflecting our program's belief that social entrepreneurship is a meta-profession drawing on cross-disciplinary knowledge and practice, the series presents prominent social entrepreneurs and leaders from multiple sectors who share their insights as cutting-edge, far-reaching change makers. We have had a phenomenal and wide variety of speakers this year, and I am here to present the legal luminary we are fortunate to have as our closer for the series. For an introduction, my name is Karen G. Ross, and I'm a 2008 Reynolds Fellow from the Law School, I'm graduating in May. It's great to see all of you here for this incredible opportunity to meet a leader in the legal field, especially as I know many of us are bogged down in finals. On a personal note, my corporate tax final is in three days, and only for special occasions would I give up precious studying time. The opportunity to see Anthony Romero, Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union, is one such special occasion because he is a change maker, a force of nature when it comes to protecting our liberties, and one of the warmest and most inspirational people you will ever meet. Anthony is the sixth Executive Director of the 81-year-old ACLU, the nation's premier defender of liberty and individual freedom. Anthony has presided over the most successful membership growth in the ACLU's history and more than doubled national staff and tripled the budget of the organization. This unprecedented growth allowed the ACLU to expand its nation nationwide litigation, lobbying, and public education efforts, including new initiatives focused on racial justice, religious freedom, privacy, reproductive freedom, and LGBT rights. Under Anthony's leadership, the ACLU gained court victories on the Patriot Act, filed landmark litigation on the torture and abuse of detainees in U.S. custody, and filed the first successful legal challenge to the Bush, Bush administration's NSA spying program. It also recently won a landmark case invalidating a company's patents on our human genes. Anthony is the first Latino and openly gay man to serve as the executive director of the ACLU. In 2005, he was named one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential Hispanics in America. Born in New York City to Puerto Rican parents, Anthony was the first in his family to graduate from high school. He's a graduate of Stanford University's Law School and Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy and International Affairs. Anthony has also previously served as the Director of Human Rights and International Cooperation at the Ford Foundation and also spent two years with the Rockefeller Foundation. I could go on and on about Anthony's accomplishments, but instead I will just say, without further ado, Welcome, Anthony. We're happy to have you here today. Now, the most important thing for any of you who will go on to careers of public speaking or lawyering is always to know who, who follows you and who introduces you. And uh, the fact that Karen Roz and her colleagues here at the Reynolds Program are the ones who helped get me here, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a cakewalk after that. I mean, Karen and I had a chance to be with her when we were both, uh, and a group of us, some of the students who were also there uh, in South Africa for what was a unique trip where we were there with a mix of established leaders, I guess that means the old guys like me, and the young leaders, which are the folks in the Reynolds program. And we were meeting the likes of Desmond Tutu and walking through the the, the very difficult places in Soweto, and then going off to look at the animals. And once in a while, we were always reeling from these different experiences that seemed almost like we were living in parallel universes. And it was the folks at the Reynolds program who, especially the students here, who helped bring me that back down to ground. And I said, did, did you have a hard time adjusting from going from the orphanage to Stellenbosch, or was it just me? Uh, and they all said, no, no, that's why we drank so much wine. And, <laughs> and I just want to say just what a thrill it is to be here with you. And so many students who turn out at this time, I just think um, it's a real testament to, to so many of, of, of you and the great work that you're doing. Now, the Reynolds program is a spectacular program. I can say this about Catherine and, uh, and Wayne because they're not here. And there are very few people who will invest in young people the way they do. And the key thing is that you have to understand that there is a quid pro quo because they're betting that you're going to go off and you're going to make a bigger difference in the world than as if they put their money 
into a school with its name on it, or into a museum, or into some endowed program, they're putting their money behind individuals and behind people. And with that enormous generosity from their part, which really comes from one of the most altruistic moments of anyone's soul, I mean, they are just remarkable people who really care about the world, comes a responsibility on your part. And that responsibility comes with making sure that you do it with passion, you do it with zeal, you do it with elan, you do it even when the, the, the odds are so hard and against you that your job is just not to give up on that seed money, that social entrepreneurial money they have put into real people. And often when we talk about social entrepreneurship, we think we're talking about businesses and balance sheets and you know, strategic plans, but social entrepreneurship is really about investing in the human spirit. And that's what they have done uh, in their philanthropy through this great fellowship program. And so I'm telling you that we're all banking on you because us middle-aged guys who are still running as fast as we can can't keep running this marathon for that much longer. And so we need the bright stars that are in this room and others to come up and pick up the baton from us because if anything, social justice, equality, human dignity, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we need the next relay runners to be able to pick up the baton from us. And let me tell you, I'm slowing down. So some of you who I know are back there are able to pick up the baton and do it all too well. So now I also want in addition to thank the Reynolds and thank you and thank Karen, I want to thank the Tea Party. Yes, the Tea Party. And I want to say that I find the Tea Party inspiring in so many ways. Now look, where else but in America could you look on television and find people with tricorn hats and Uncle Sam outfits, waving little bags of Lipton tea bags. It reminds me of Halloween in the West Village, which is always a place <laughs> where you'll find me. It's kind of like the village people of the Glenn Beck era. And I, I'm, I'm fantasizing about the idea that these tea parties will start going out, YMCA. I mean, it's just like, it's out of a movie. You can expect them to do it. And it also reminds me a lot of someone who spends a lot of time around the United States in places that I can't find on the map, but I can remember the people I talked to, that the Tea Partiers really mangle some of the most basic freedoms that our founding fathers and our founding mothers, who were never given the credit they deserve, really understood, but that these folks are just mangling those basic principles. And I also think that the Tea Partiers frankly, remind us in a much more somber way just how tenuous our freedoms are. And if you really look closely, just really how vicious the kind of influence that they have on people who call themselves political leaders. It is astonishing when you think that we have come this far in America to find American citizens screaming racial epithets at some of the great civil rights leaders like John Lewis or calling Barney Frank a faggot, or spitting on other members of Congress, like Congressman Lewis. And don't get me wrong, uh, I'm at the ACLU, I love protests. That's what we do, we believe in it. And if the Tea Partiers were at some point being prevented from being able to assemble freely or speak their minds, we'd be there in a nanosecond, bringing a case saying that they have the right to speak their minds. And we would take that case all the way up to the Supreme Court, like we've often done with some very difficult protests and freedom of speech cases. But it is the vitriol, and it's the bigotry, and it's the aggression that underlies sometimes what is appropriate speech and sometimes what is inappropriate speech, which really should be the canary in the coal mine for us. You know, the canary in the coal mine is always that metaphor we use that when the miners used to go down to the coal mines before they had the technology we still don't have today, they would bring canaries. And when the canaries would stop singing or chirping, it would tell them that in fact the oxygen in the coal mines had become too thin for human or animal existence. So it was an example of get out. When you begin to see this level of vicious bigotry, not just episodic, but organized, defended, 
uh, not decried by even the political leadership of the Republican Party. The canaries in the coal mine are beginning to chirp a little more quietly. And we have to wonder about what the impact that would be on our democracy long term. Now let's be clear, politicians often pander to the worst instincts of those who are extremists. They try to take those they, they can't comfortably rely upon and bring them into their base. They take for granted a base that they know is going to be there regardless. And they often compromise what are core issues of principle for, for the sake of political expediency. The years since the civil rights victories of the 1960s exposed a very pernicious streak of bigotry and prejudice and violence in the American electorate. We did not make the progress today by relying upon public opinion. If we had relied upon public opinion, we would never would have desegregated the nation's schools. If we had relied upon public opinion, women would never have given, been given the right to vote. That those hard-fought battles were only won because we had the political will and we had political leaders who were willing to make the hard decisions of what was best for the nation. Now we have political leaders who take public opinion polls and figure out what they should say based on what the public thinks. They would rather follow than lead. They will pander rather than ponder. And what is so disappointing about the context in which we're in is that so many of the very difficult issues that are before us require that older, established willingness to lead in very important ways. It's especially hard to talk about this in the current political context. We are living in a time of war. Wars are great for politicians. They use them to justify kidnapping and torture, indefinite detention, life sentences for minor crimes, the suspension of constitutional rights on a massive scale. Wars allow politicians to push through very large budgets that allow them to grant contracts to industries that may underwrite their campaigns later on or even be populated with some of their former cronies. Wars also allow candidates to take the most extreme of rhetoric and portray those who disagree with them as simply un-American, as weak, or as out of touch. And the history of this approach of using war as a way to demonize those who oppose you is easy to trace. 1968, Richard Nixon. He campaigned for president using what some people call dog whistle phrases. Dog whistles, the type of whistles that when you blow on it, only a dog can hear. And it looks innocuous enough. But certain phrases that when you use those words, white bigoted voters can hear the whistle. They know exactly how that whistle sounds when you use words like law and order or activist judges. And when you plug on that whistle, most of us don't pay attention. We just say, okay, law and order, yeah, we're all for law and order, and activist judge as well. No more activists in the recent Supreme Court on the campaign finance case, but okay, we shouldn't like activist judges. But yet, it, it, it rallies around a group of individuals who will hear that whistle and take the cue as empowering them to unleash yet an even more destructive force in our democracy. You don't have to take my word for the origins of the cynical political ploy of trying to fuel white resentment and racism and xenophobia that's really apparent in today's Tea Party. You can really go back and look at the words of the first black chairman of the Republican Party who told an interviewer, quote, for the last 40 plus years we had a southern strategy that alienated minority voters by focusing on the white, white male vote in the South. That's exactly what they did. That was conscious. 
So by any means necessary to get the white male vote in the South, they would alienate minority voters and undercut basic rights and basic principles in ways that we have now seen. Ronald Reagan took the Southern strategy to a new level. He launched his general campaign in Mississippi. Now check this out. Governor from California. I didn't know this until I started researching for this speech. Governor of California. Uh, would have been perfect for him to launch his campaign in Hollywood. He would have had a lot of his boys and girls there. But he decided instead to go to a Mississippi county that is known in history for the murder of three civil rights workers. That's the county he picked. And he launched his campaign with the same states' rights rhetoric that was a lovely little dog whistle that the segregationists of the past remembered and embraced and saying, yeah, if we had state rights, we wouldn't have civil rights. I'm a state rights person. Eight years after that, Willie Horton, a black felon who raped and murdered a white woman on furlough from a Massachusetts prison, became a television commercial that doomed the, the presidential hopes of Michael Dukakis. The Republican message was crystal clear. Black and Latino people committed crimes, and Democrats let them. But then something really peculiar happened. The Democrats started taking notes, started taking off from the same playbook. 1992, Bill Clinton flew back from a campaign stop to oversee the execution of a mentally disabled black man in Arkansas, proving that Democrats could be tough on crime as well. In his 1994 State of the Union speech, Clinton endorsed a federal law that said three strikes you're out, three misdemeanors, and the, we'll treat you like a convicted felon. Then George Bush used the 9-11 attacks to disguise a very naked power grab by the executive branch, calling his efforts to eliminate the Constitution's checks and balances as a war on terror. These seem like disparate events, but how we deal with crime in America and how we deal with the war on terror, and yet so many of the lexicons, the strategies, the impact on core liberty, liberties are exactly the same. Even Barack Obama, when you go back and look at his statements as a candidate, would have to show his tough on crime bona fides in order for him to become President of the United States. He said, quote, I have passed 150 pieces of legislation that toughen penalties for violent criminals. That was one of his campaign statements. And lamentably, when we look at his record over the last year and three months, he's continued some of the worst aspects of the Bush war on terror, where it's been a change in rhetoric, but not been a change in reality. I'll explain. When you think about what we confronted after the Bush years, this was not a minor problem of some folks who broke the law, some bad apples, some rogue soldiers. We are talking about an eight-year period where some of the issues and some of the events were previously unfathomable to me when I was a third-year law student like Karen. If you had asked me in a third-year law review exam, do you think it would be possible to take an American citizen and apprehend them on American soil and not charge them with a crime, and hold them indefinitely. Yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely not. Not in our America. Happens in China, happens in Cuba. If you would have said in that same law school multiple choice exam, which I never really had, I wish I had had, I would have done better, I think. Um, can you imagine a president enacting a law that, it, that intercepts the communications, phone calls, emails, financial records, employment records, student records of anyone in American soil? without consulting Congress, or without consulting any court, no, the president doesn't get to legislate. Uh, no, false. Can you imagine any American official authorizing torture, which is clearly established by the, the, our criminal domestic statutes, including waterboarding, which means that you're pouring water down a person's throat and allowing them to believe that they are drowning, or the placement of a power drill 
next to a person's ear as you have stripped them naked and held them uh, blindfolded. Or the placement of individuals in coffin-sized boxes where in this wonderful Justice Department memo that if you really want to see it, you email me, I'll send you the, the excerpt, where in, in this great letterhead from the Justice Department saying, you have inquired about whether or not it would be appropriate to place an individual in a coffin-sized box with insects that bite. That is not allowed. However, you can place the individual in a coffin-sized box with insects that you lead the defendant to believe are biting, but as long as they're not biting insects, that won't be considered torture. Written from the Office of Legal Counsel, the highest level of our Justice Department, interpreting the great values and aspirations of our founding fathers, all that and more you see in our documents. And if you had asked me eight years ago, would this happen any time in your America? I would say no. And yet all of that has indeed transpired. And so what happened over the last eight years isn't akin to some minor problems here and there we need to tweak. It isn't akin to just taking out the bush garbage and saying, okay, we kicked them out. Garbage is out. No more Cheney, no more Rumsfeld, no more Addington, no more you know, Ashcroft, no more Gonzalez. The list goes forever. Ro no more Rove. Right? That's not taking out the garbage. What they did to the American legal system is a complete toxic waste dump. You don't just pick up a little bit of the dirt on Three Mile Island and say, we cleaned up the toxic waste site. Now you can go back and live there, folks. The radioactivity is gone because I cleaned the soil. What they did was so deeply rooted against so many core principles and established laws that it requires a level of tenacity and a level of interest and zeal, the likes of which we have still not seen from this administration. This administration continues to use the same arguments to bar people from bringing cases before the court, where one of the biggest challenges we confront is the inability to get into court, because even when we file a case, they'll often bounce us out of court to say, to litigate even this case presents a state secret issue. So even when you have a case, you can't bring your evidence or call your witnesses or try to convince a judge because they say, whoa, 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 whoa. We'll totally compromise national security if we let you go through with this. One of those cases is a case of Mr. Al Masri, uh, a German citizen picked up in Macedonia. With a, it's a case of uh, wrongful identity. He had the wrong name, shipped off to Bagram. Five months later, they tortured him there. They find, five months later, they find out they had the wrong guy. They put him back on another plane, another CIA plane. They leave him this time off in Albania. It's almost out of a James Bond movie. They tell him, just keep walking and don't look back. He ends up going to authorities, and he ends up finding his way back home, and his lawyer in Germany ends up finding us. We try to bring a lawsuit on his behalf just to claim the fact that when you kidnap someone and torture them and then dump them in another foreign country, you should have your day in court. You should let us, let us call the witness. Let's cross-examine some folks. Let us present the facts. That case was booted out of court on a motion to dismiss. It's a little legalese, but you can figure it out. They didn't allow us to call one witness try to dis make any discovery because of the state secrets privilege. That same argument that happened under the Bush years is being argued by the Obama administration in a similar case out of California where we're going after this Boeing subsidiary that has been providing the airline flight service on the rendition flights. The very same state secrets argument. No, 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 we can't, we can't even let you present the case ACLU, because if you do so, we'll, be, we'll find ourselves in a situation where national security will be compromised. Now, the fact is, what I'm telling you is fully in the public domain. Most of the evidence we've collected is evidence that we don't, we don't have access to classified documents. They won't give it to us. 
you won't be surprised. Most of what we've collected has been with good, thorough research that's already in the public domain, tracking journalists, tracking airplane tag numbers, trying to figure out who knew what when. And so many of these issues are not of the, the compromise or the, the compromising quality you would find in, say, in, in a real state secrets case. You find the, the, the Obama White House now on the verge of throwing back the 9-11 defendants into military commissions. These are the worst of the worst, supposedly, Mr. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Mohammed and his allies. They were also tortured, waterboarded, held in secret prisons, and often in, in many of them in Poland or in Romania, shipped off to Guantanamo, haven't seen a lawyer until uh, two and a half years ago. The first charge was brought before these military commissions that were enacted by the Bush administration. Military commissions that were, in, that were designed to render a guilty verdict. Military commissions that have never been used before. We've had, we've had military commissions. We didn't want to use those. We had criminal courts. We didn't want to use those. So we decided to create a new legal system. That's what you do. You know, you got these real bad criminals you really want to convict? Let's start all over again. To hell with 200 years of jurisprudence. Let's just make up a new legal system as we go along. And so in this new legal system, they would allow evidence gleaned from torture, evidence gleaned from hearsay. Hearsay is gossip. You know, if you saw me kill someone and they call you to the stand, you're a witness, you can point at me, that's evidence. If you saw me kill someone and you whispered to her and all they could call is her and I can't rebut the fact like what's your vision like, were you really there, you know, all the evidence you want to make sure that the person could truly identify you. Hearsay evidence is gossip. They're allowing hearsay evidence. They're allowing coerced evidence. They are allowing minors to be treated for crimes. Uh, minors to be treated as adults uh, for crimes they committed as minors. And it was completely rigged to have an outcome where these individuals would get convicted as quickly and as expeditiously as possible with the least due process as possible. Obama comes in, says, I'm closing Guantanamo. Holder comes after him and says, I'm going to throw them into the criminal courts. That's, our courts are equipped to deal with the most difficult of terrorism cases. We've tried more than 300 terrorism cases, including the blind shake here in New York and other cases, that successfully, and now the Obama administration, if you read and believe the press reports in the Washington Post and New York Times, are poised to throw them back into the military commissions in yet another inferior system of justice. With, there's, you know, they've, they've fixed it. They've banned evidence gleaned on torture, that's great. They're allowing evidence gleaned on coercion. You know, coercion's in, the line between coercion and torture is in the eye of the beholder or the receiver, if you will. Right? So coerced, coerced evidence is OK. Some hearsay evidence is banned, but some hearsay evidence is allowed. And these are the folks they want to try the most prominent, difficult criminal cases in our modern lives. I mean, if our grandparents ever talked about the Rosenberg cases, you've heard of it? This is our modern-day Rosenbergs. And if we cut any corner as we endeavor to get justice for the deaths of, that duly happened on 9-11, that we should seek justice. If we cut any corner, we'll undercut our moral authority going forward. Now I switch gears. War on terror, you know, where you have efforts to undercut due process, we have efforts to change the legal system, efforts that really go to the heart of whether or not you are treating individuals based on the colors of their skin or their race and religion is being used as a proxy for suspicion. Let's talk about crime in America. Now, I'm taking a leap of faith here. I've never done this speech before. It's a new one. Look at the facts about the tough on crime approach. White Americans use drugs at the same rate as minority Americans. It's an established empirical fact. And white young people are more likely to sell drugs than minority youth. 
also an empirical fact. I have the footnotes if you want them. Three quarters of those incarcerated on drug charges are black or Latino. And despite that, many law enforcement officials claim that they're trying to be dr uh, focused on the drug kingpins and the major players. Police dragnets pull in very few kingpins. Four-fifths of all drug arrests in America are for simple possession and not sales. 80% of the growth in drug arrests in recent years is for marijuana, not for heroin or cocaine. White affluent communities have been largely unaffected. The effect has been devastating among minority communities who have been targeted by law enforcement officials with the same zeal and the same dog whistle phrases that we've used on Muslims and Arabs in the war on terror. Today, we have a very simple three-step process that fills up the criminal justice system with black, Latino men and women. First, they're harvested by extraordinary firepower in minority communities and public schools. I'll get to that. Then, they're warehoused, often spending years in inhumane prison conditions. And third, they're released back into communities that failed them before and are certainly not able to help them deal with the issues once they return, only that they're more disenfranchised and they're more segregated from the American mainstream. Now, I'm not saying that this criminal justice system is explicitly designed to push minority men back into the pre-civil rights status, but I am saying that if you had tried to design a system that was explicitly designed to push minority men back into a pre-civil rights status, you could f hardly find a better system. The process starts as early as elementary school. We have just done a study of the use of police power in New York City schools. I'll tell you one story. It's a great report. Got lots of charts, lots of data. I love stories. 17-year-old Biko Edwards of Brooklyn found himself rushing to a chemistry class. His chemistry teacher was a total pain in the ass. Wanted to make sure he was always there on time. Weren't there on time, the bell rang, he didn't come in. One demerit. You didn't get, you, your attendance was, was, was stopped. He was stopped in the hallway, Stephen Biko, by the assistant principal for security that told him to slow down and stop running. Stephen Biko was an African-American uh, member of the soccer team trying to run to class. He explained to the assistant principal for security that he was trying to get to class. And when the assistant principal ordered Biko to the detention center instead because he mouthed back to the assistant principal, and Biko still protested, he's kind of one of us, he's kind of this you know, outspoken fella. The assistant principal for security demanded that a police officer arrest him. Now, I've been a mouthy kid most of my life. You know, I've mouthed off to a lot of the nuns and priests who taught me in Catholic school. Rarely, it never, <laughs> have they ever called the police on me. The police officer slammed Biko against a brick door divider, cutting open his face, and then maced the 11th grader. Biko was taken to the hospital. He was cuffed to the chair while they were stitching up his face. After the hospital, they took him downtown where he was booked on five criminal charges until we took his case. That's just one example. That happens regularly in so many schools across America where rather than deal with discipline in ways that might have gotten you detention or might have gotten you suspension, we treat our schools like training penitentiaries, where they are training grounds for little prisoners and little prison guards. And it becomes this revolving door of failed schools, children who are failed by the system. It becomes this school-to-prison pipeline that once you get pulled into that revolving door of that first arrest when you're 15 years old, 
It's not that hard then to find yourself with a second arrest and a third arrest in as policed an environment as what you find. Move to the streets. In many neighborhoods, you find racial profiling on the highways. That's an established fact. We have those studies. You also find the fact that, the, that many police officers are targeting certain minority communities and minority members because they look suspicious. You don't think I'm uh, telling the full truth and nothing but the truth? Pick up the newspaper and read about Arizona. What the hell's going on there, right? Now it is mandatory. It is mandatory, and a police department can be sued if it doesn't do this. If local law enforcement officials don't stop individuals for whom they have a reasonable suspicion to believe they are undocumented and ask to see their papers, please. So if some cop happens to say, I'm not going to stop any brown or minority looking people, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe in that. You know, I don't believe in racial profiling. That police department could be sued because he is being demanded that he pull over anyone for whom you have a reasonable suspicion who is an undocumented person. And then you have to argue, well, I didn't have reasonable suspicion. Well, what does an undocumented person look like? Well, in Arizona, they might look like brown folks or Mexicans. And how come you didn't pull over any Mexicans? Because I don't know which Mexicans are undocumented. But you know most undocumented folks in Arizona might be Mexican. You're compelling police officers to conduct the very type of racial profiling which is completely barred by the Constitution. This effort is not just local. You find this effort to target undocumented immigrants or people we perceive to be undocumented immigrants and treat them like criminals in places like Hazleton, Pennsylvania, where if you, there was an ordinance that said if you sold a croissant to an undocumented immigrant, that would be a crime. And what did the police officers do? They would park their cars in front of the Latino stores, people, places where you can buy a taco or some salsa or some guava juice. And they would go into the stores. And as people were shopping for their foods, they would ask them to see their papers. Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Farmers Branch, Texas. There is this phenomenon that is not as isolated as you just are led to believe by looking at the, at the one. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not soft on crime. That's what they often think, the American Criminal Liberties Union. Um, that's what Edwin Meese called us once. I grew up in the public housing projects. I know what crime is. I saw murders, at the, not in person see murders, but I saw families around me at the age of nine who were murdered by drug uh, difficulties. My father was held up on too many occasions. I saw drugs at too early an age. I can tell you, however, that after that, as Karen told you, I was fortunate enough to go to some fancy schools and I went to Princeton. Um, I can assure you that random searches on the Princeton campus would turn up this, at least as many drugs uh, as I saw in the Bronx. But you know, it's never gonna happen. It's just, it's not gonna happen in NYU either, so don't worry, especially not in exams. <laughs> and even if it did, the fact is, the gavel of the law would never come down the way it comes down on minority communities. Because look, the Princeton kids who I knew got busted for drugs, which there were a couple, had lawyers. Their parents with money got them off with a minimum of, a, of an after effect. They would fly in so quickly and sit in that president's office. There was no way that that little drug bust was going to put that person on a pathway to criminality. And yet, when you think about that same challenge happening for a poor kid in Spanish Harlem, whose parents don't have lawyers, the only lawyer he's going to see is a public defender he might meet five minutes before he becomes before a judge, where he's not empowered to fight, he or she is not empowered to fight for their rights. And yet, you find that that first step into that quagmire is often the most pivotal and difficult of steps. And then you look at three strikes are out, three little misdemeanors come add up to a felony. You look at this racial targeting, you look at the increase of police power, 
you find then the result is from 1980, where we had 500,000 prisoners, we have now 2.3 million people. And the rate of incarceration for black males is six and a half times higher than for white males. Minor offenses that had been ignored in affluent communities or in places like Princeton are now being used and so broad and so aggressive that they have enormous repercussions for minority Americans. And I think one of the things we have to grapple with is how we rationalize this increased focus on crime, on the war on terror, on the erosion of basic principles that allow us to really say, well, if black males are six and a half times more likely to be in prison than white males, what does that mean for the idea that we're all equal? What does it mean to have access to justice or access to due process when you really can't have access to a, a lawyer whether you're at Guantanamo or whether you're at the Manhattan Correction Facility because you've been hauled in for crack cocaine. What does due process mean if you don't have a lawyer? What does it mean when the laws are rewritten and they're done in such an aggressive fashion to ensure the outcome even before the full facts are vetted before you, whether it's the state secrets doctrine or whether it's the mandatory minimums where the judges have no discretion to lower the sentence because of mitigating factors. That's changing some, but it's still not great. And so we have to connect these ideas that we, have, we are rejigging basic important parts of the war on terror and the war on drugs or the war on minority communities in ways that affect the fabric of our society. Now why have I tried to splice what are often Two different talks in my mind, right? I've done some of these talks before. I can give you other statistics. I didn't put it on this, on this sheet. How much does it cost to house a prisoner in California for a year? $47,000. How much does it cost to send someone to Berkeley? $30,000. Does it make sense for us to be housing people on three misdemeanors and putting them a year away in prison rather than putting them a year in a community college or a better yet, even Berkeley? Are those the decisions we're making, rational decisions that smart social entrepreneurs would put their business plans behind? I don't think so. But the reason why I'm trying to connect it is that most people think about the war on terror as not my problem. You know, I'm not a guy in an orange jumpsuit. I might be Muslim. I might not be. But these are not folks I identify with. So why do I care about whether or not they're in military commissions, or whether they allow hearsay evidence, or whether they see a lawyer, or whether they've been tortured. But when you think about the fact that 2.3 million Americans are in the criminal justice system, and they might not be of the magnitude of the waterboarding or torture that you see in Guantanamo or Bagram, but that some of the same systemic problems that we are grappling with on the stage of national security are also the same ones we're dealing with in the criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system affects us all that much more. That's a lot more than the 200 people at Guantanamo. We got 2.3 million Americans in correction facilities who are going to come back into our midst. And that possibility of trying to link those ideas and have us think through what type of country do we really want to be, I think is an essential one. How do you make this case? Skipping the rest of this because I saw my cue card. How do you make this case? It's often hard. I mean, I've talked a little bit more about the law here because there are many great lawyers. Uh, lawyers already, I'm calling you. You got it? Yeah. Um, but we also can't speak in the terms of the law because this is a conversation we have to have in a broader public. And you kind of lose people when you're focusing on, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, preponderance of the evidence, you know, the rebuttal clause. I'm, those are, you're, you're not going to get people to think or three strikes you're out. Even things that might resonate a little bit more, people are not going to focus on it. So I've been playing with an idea which I gave in a speech in Arizona when I was out there uh, 10 days ago trying to prevent this damn law from going into place. But, you know, sometimes you're just, you know, you're out there with a little fire hose and the whole, the whole planet's burning. 
um, until we sue them, which would be next week. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no press in the room, right? Um, but I've been thinking about this idea of redemption. Now, that's an idea that we can communicate in any context or religion. You know, you can think about it any number of ways. You always get a second bite at the apple. There's a midterm, there's a final. You get to redeem the midterm with a final. The prodigal son gets to come home. You turn the other cheek. So many different sources you can pull that talk about redemption. We all make mistakes. We all get better from them. And yet if we think about how we deal with crime and punishment in America, and you try to tap into that great deep part of the human spirit, whether you're secular, sectarian, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheistic, but you believe in the goodness of redemption, because that is what you hope when you screw up, that you'll have the chance for yourself to be redeemed, that your business might run a loss for the first two years, and yet it'll go in the black. That is, I think, one of the ways to talk about black or red. Did I get that wrong? Is it, but I went to black. I saw you're looking quizzically at me. You have to, I'm trying to follow your, your glance. That that exactly is what we can tap into. And I think that unless we try to talk about some of these most difficult, systemic, seemingly intractable issues in ways that are really grounded in the ways that people experience their own lives, their own spirits, their own families, their own children, their own friends, their own neighbors. You're not going to get the traction on those issues that you wish. And that's why for me this, the, the importance of telling this work as a narrative and then evoking the best in all of us. Because at the end of the day, those values that we've all believed in our lives, whether it's redemption or equality or due process, those are things that when you think about a moment when you're proud to be an American and you salute the flag or you sing the Star Spangled Banner or you're contemplating uh, in a quiet moment in your home about what are you proud of? What are you proud of being here in this country? What are you proud of in your own life? What are you proud of of your own character? Those are the things that you're likely to reflect upon. And so to project those out from what you're proud of in yourselves into what you expect your own society to be proud of. And then you get a very clear roadmap for what just you won't be proud of. And I know that with all of you projecting that very strong, positive spirit as the next generation, this country is going to be as fantastic as it should be. Thank you very, very much for having me. We now have time for question and answers. Um, and there's going to be a microphone over here. And a microphone over here. So if you have a question, you can line up find any of them. Oh, I dropped my microphone. And got my pen. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Adam Wexabam. I thank you for being here. Adam. Adam, hi. Adam Wexabam, I thank you for being here. I'm a rising senior at Gallatin studying. Um, law and community organizing. So I found it a natural fit to intern at Lambda Legal, which is a fellow public interest law firm. That's great. Now, where my question lies is, I wonder if there is ever a um, problem when you have litigation or organizing strat strategy, and that sometimes conflicts with perhaps your mission or your principles that the organization stands behind. And I wonder how you mitigate this sometimes tension between what, how to win and what's the right thing to do. Great. Thank you. Well, how long do we have for questions? We have a half hour or so, so I could just, should we clip through a bunch of them? All right, I'll, I promise you I'll, I'll get to that question. If I don't, you just jump up and I'll make sure I answer it. Oh, um, so thank you. I'm Claudia Perez I'm. Hi, I was, Claudia, how are you? Hi. Uh, great, Anthony. Thank you for being here. I just want to say it's an Puerto incredible. Puerto Rican or Dominican? Cubana. 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 Ni I have a, uh, yes, I have like. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, mention I mean, I was born in Cuba. My parents are both Cubans. I've 
personally witnessed, I mean, unspeakable human rights violations. I was lucky enough to be able to move to Austria, and here I am at this prestigious institution, and I'm a Reynolds scholar, so, you know, it's interesting to see how things work out. Um, but now I've been, always been struggling with the idea of what does redemption mean, something that you mentioned. Now, recently, we've seen the Damas in Blanco that I'm sure you, you've yeah. heard of. They're wives, mothers, sisters of political prisoners who've been held without, without habeas corpus in Cuba, who have been um, attacked just aggressively by the government, and it's a situation that is um, quickly deteriorating. So my question for you is, what does redemption mean, and what is the role of the U.S. in uh, this greater framework? I mean, we have, you know, back and forth going with the embargo and, you know, the Cuban community and what it's done in Cuba. But my question is, what is, what is the role for young people like me who want to have something, some say in this and some have some deeper Im impact throughout the course of their careers? And what does redemption really mean when you're facing a society that is so deeply mm -hmm. disintegrating? Mm -hmm. So quickly, thank That's you. Great. Hi. Hi, I'm Ben Lack. I'm ben? a Reynolds Hi. Fellow. I'm at the law school. Great. Thanks what, for coming. What year are you there? I'm a 2L. Great. Do you know Norman Dorson? Uh, we're not, we don't hang out very much. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. If you can take his course, he's a great teacher. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention to him in the hallway that you... Yeah, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I also wanted to, to respond to your, wh what you were saying about redemption, because it's, really, it's a really powerful idea that I... I mean, I find very moving, but I also feel like I, I have to push back on it a little bit. Go um, for it. Uh, I'm, I do a lot of work in immigration with the Immigrant Rights Clinic at, at NYU. We're doing a lot of work, um, sort of the crimin divide, criminal immigration law nexus. And uh, one issue that we keep facing when we're trying to think about how we should be messaging is, uh, you know, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, Someone who has uh, a, a, a someone who's a long-term who's a, a legal permanent resident or is not documented at all, if they commit a crime, you know they can serve the same sentence as someone who's a citizen, but then afterwards they pay this additional price of facing right. deportation. Right. Uh, and so, do I? Should we really be hinging the argument on the contention that you know they deserve a, a second chance? I mean, even if I know today that this person is going to return to commit another crime, be it a misdemeanor or a felony. Mm -hmm. Should the sort of the punitive outcome really hinge on mm -hmm. whether they're redeemed or not? Thanks. Great. Someone else? Yes. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Um, Hi. What studying year environmental are you? studies at CAS. I'm rising senior. Okay. What's um, I'm CA, one of the first. CAS is College of Arts and Science. Okay. Great. Um, so, so undergrad. I'm, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm one of the first to be lost in the legal talk, so I appreciate you bringing it down. Um, understandable for the rest of us. Um, sure, I there was a time there where I lost you and I tried to do it at the very end, so <laughs> I apologize. I, I followed most of it. Okay, I'm sure you did. Especially, um, especially I want to bring it here. back to something you said at the beginning you were talking about, and actually it's interesting that you use the same term, vitriol, this, this kind of like, you know, this negative banter that's going on, and I know a lot of the opponents of the president right now in the administration using this kind of language and this hostility. Um, how do you counter that? He's now receiving a lot of flack and, and there's a lot of debate and discussion on, on kind of his rhetoric and, and what the form of rhetoric is in that context. How do, you, how, do you f how do you push back against people that are using these kind of this negative slander um, without coming across as, uh, I think, acidic is one of the words that I saw describe, him describe as, um, when, when so much of that does feel like, particularly for me, that's, that's how I would want to respond to that. I want to respond with you know, hostility. How do you respond um, kind of gently and um, in a way that's not going to isolate any other kind of would-be supporters? Mm -hmm. And, who's, and who's, uh, whose role is that? Is it the president's role? Is it his aide's role? Is it your role? Um, it's not my role. Yeah. I don't work for the guy. In fact, <laughs> I sue him more than I work for him. Thank but you. There, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Nathaniel. Okay, we got four. Let's see if we go for T five. Ten for one. Hi. Um, going back to the cases you mentioned at the beginning of school abuse and cases of... Um, What's your name? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My name is Rafael Hernandez. I work here at NYU Wagner. Great. Um, I've read a lot of, of, the, of cases like these that you mentioned, and many times the comments on the newspapers or the websites when you mention a case like this, oh, for example, a 12-year-old that was coughed because she wrote on, the, on her desk or something like that. Yeah. Um, 
the response is, oh, well, she should have done what they told her to do. Oh, this wouldn't have happened if this student had paid attention. And, and I want to raise again, uh, in, in this sense, also the issue of taser use mm -hmm. and all these cases where people not committing a crime just because they didn't obey uh, an order by, from a cop have been killed. There were 57 killed, I think, in Florida mm -hmm. this, this year. Um, how do you sell the idea of redemption in a society that's becoming more and more uh, prone to authoritarianism in defense of uh, safety. Okay, so let's, let's uh, well, and then you can all start thinking about the next round of five because we'll definitely have time. Is, I'll stay here for as long as you are able and then if not, you can hit the libraries and or the bars. Um, <laughs> not for you, Nathaniel, I don't think you're drinking age yet and so I'm hoping <laughs> you just hit the library. <laughs> no offense. Uh, okay. I mean, I think for Adams, your, your first question about how you deal with conflicting strategies or mission or goals, and I, I have to, where is Adam? I'm trying to make eye contact. Okay. It's, uh, that's some of the hardest work that we do in the organization. And it happens rarely, but when it happens, we take an enormous amount of, of time and care to figure it out. So, sometimes it, the easiest part, and I think your first part of the question, which was the right uh, intro to it, the right prologue, is that actually integrating litigation with communications, with a lobbying effort, with a grassroots effort, is the most effective way to do the right work. And when you do that well, you build crescendos and you have progress in a way that is just remarkable, right? So look at, look at the Patriot Act as a good example. The Patriot Act was passed 30 days after 9-11 in October. Everyone loved it, even the name of it except for us, um, but everyone loved the law. I would say, without being immodest, I would say about five years into the Bush presidency, the word Patriot Act became radioactive. You know, people were, they would, I, would hear, I would do debates or, or interviews on the radio show, and some of the interviewers would say, yeah, the guy, Jose Padilla, who's being held without charges or trial, it's terrible that the Patriot Act allows that. I'm like, no, 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 that's not the... Not in the Patriot Act. But why did that happen? It's because we had litigation that showed the problems of the Patriot Act. We worked really hard with Congress to get people in Congress hold hearings on the problems of the Patriot Act. We enacted these local Bill of Rights defense committees at the state level that passed, I don't know, 300 resolutions saying that the Patriot Act was unconstitutional and that local jurisdictions had difficulty with the Patriot Act. And before you knew it, you were building these crescendos up in a way that you changed the public debate. And if you only use the law, if you only use lobbying, if you only use grassroots on things of such national significance, I don't think you're, you have a, diverse, a diversified enough portfolio. I'm trying to keep using these social entrepreneur metaphors for you because um, that's what Catherine Reynolds wants me to do. Um, but you have to have a diversified portfolio on how you make social change. And I think that's one way to look at it. It's rare uh, when, they, when the issues co co uh, collide, you really got to step back and figure out what, do you, what are your true values. So I'll give you one place that we have a very hard case, but it's the right call. And one case that was a very hard case that is still the right call, um, but it's not without its challenges, right? So Fred Phelps, a disgusting, homophobic uh, minister who's been organizing uh, protests at the funerals of the fallen men and women of the Iraq and Afghani wars, where he and his homophobic protesters will get up there and say, the reason why American soldiers are dying are because you're giving rights to gay people, right? And there have been local ordinances that have tried to ban him and his congregation from protesting on public streets and on public grounds. In a private cemetery, you can ban them. On a private street or a private memorial service, you can ban them. But in our America, you don't get to ban someone from doing a protest in a public street or public grounds just because you don't like what he has to say. It's terrible the most solemn moment of that family's life. And they're burying their son and daughter because they served our country. And this man is throwing a whole other set of issues 
at them. You know, their son and daughters are not, you know, are not even or necessarily gay. You know, they're just men and women in uniform. And we defend his right to have these public protests. Now, that's a tough case. Uh, but if you allow the government to ever deny the ability for any one protester to speak his or her mind in public space, following all the rules with permits, time and place, restrictions, um, you're quickly going to find it's going to be the anti-war protesters who are going to find themselves on the other side of that, uh, of that, uh, that shoe. And you know, that's not an easy case for a lot of organizations. It wouldn't be a case that Lambda would take up. Uh, it would be a case that the ACLU takes up because we believe in the importance of, in a free and open democracy, the only response to speech you hate is more speech. Now, we'll get to how you balance that with the Nathaniel's questions about the acidity of the, some of the speech. Um, another case. This one's a little bit more, it's line drawing is in a lot of this. I'll give you three cases, uh, quickly. Um, there, there was a group of anti-choice uh, protesters who were taking photographs of women coming in and out of Planned Parenthood clinics on the public sidewalk snapping pictures of women going in and out, and then posting them on websites so that you could see who was uh, visiting a Planned Parenthood clinic. I forget the jurisdiction. And there was, again, an effort to try to shut down through governmental force those websites with photographs of people on the streets. And Planned Parenthood came to us and said, what do you think? Can we do this together? And they were trying to do something by enacting a statute that would ban people from photographing on that local jurisdiction and then uploading it. And we couldn't do it because, frankly, you know, in an open democratic society, when the minute you start saying, we don't like the type of photograph you're taking, and we're then we're trying to take pictures of the Rodney King police officers who are beating the hell out of a young African-American or Latino guy, and you can't use that same photograph or you won't allow them the same access to it, that becomes a conundrum. Uh, Third case that comes out a little bit differently. There was a website, uh, it was a Nuremberg case, where they would list the names and addresses of all the doctors who committed abortions, uh, who, who performed abortions. And this group, every, and the addresses, their private home addresses. And every time there was a doctor who was executed, which there were several on this list, they would put a gray line through it. Now that crosses a different line, because that you're really dealing with you know, questions of incitement, you're encouraging violence, you're encouraging killing. I mean, not to everyone, but it's clear that's what the roadmap of that is. And that was not a case that we defended. Um, but those are the places where you often have to struggle with it. And as a multi-issue organization whose charge is to defend the rights of all people in all parts of America, we often run ourselves into a little bit of more of a difficult conundrum because you have to defend the rights of even people you, you hate. And in fact, it's the pariah groups who have the most difficulty exercising their rights. It's very rare I get some white liberal billionaire who you know, lives a good life asking me for help in their cases. You know, I do get once in a while kind of a Republican senator who was toe-tapping in the bathroom <laughs> and signaling under the door and was arrested for solicitation of sex and said that was a crime and we jumped in and said, no, that, you know, in America you get to speak your mind, you get to solicit sex wherever you want. Most of pe people do it in a bar or a restaurant. <laughs> this fella was doing it in the bathroom. You don't have the right to, con to commit or have sex in a bathroom, but you can solicit sex wherever you want. And to his chagrin, we jumped in and defended Senator Craig and we're on the, the uh, What's that show with uh, Barbara Walters and Whippy Goldberg? The View. Yeah, The View. I mean, we had 10 minutes of debate about whether or not this was a good case for the ACL and The View. I mean, you can't get real estate like that. It's amazing. <laughs> um, all right. Let's move. Uh, the question, uh, Claudia, right, on, yeah, on Cuba. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I have an enormous amount of empathy and, and belief in what's going on in Cuba. It's just horrific. I mean, this is my personal opinion. This is not an ACLU position. It's the American Civil Liberties <coughs> Union. We only express positions on U.S. issues and the 
the effect of the U.S. government overseas. So, you know, so Guantanamo is, is, is okay because the U.S. is torturing, holding people in Guantanamo, but, you know, what's happening in the Cuban government holding people there is not in my work day. But I will give you my personal opinion. I think it, it requires a great deal more thought and analysis and gets done, and especially from liberal Americans. As someone who considers myself to be left of center, I think we often, for many years, turned a blind eye to what happened in Cuba. And I, I think the question of redemption is not to say that you have to redeem all individuals. But you have to think about a system that promotes redemption for those who are caught up in an unfair system. And I wouldn't necessarily put you know, tyrants and dictators or people like Dick Cheney or John Yu, I'm not saying they're tyrants or dictators, but they're war criminals in my mind. And I have no desire to redeem Dick Cheney. In fact, in my mind, we should prosecute the hell out of him. You know, he should serve time. You know, if you authorize waterboarding and torture and torturing of children and torturing of pregnant women, which we have seen in the files, and we have autopsy reports that demonstrate uh, homicides done by army medical personnel, and those have never been prosecuted, I have no desire to redeem some of those crimes, or some of those individuals. But I'm looking to how do you construct a system that allows those individuals, not necessarily the architects of it, not necessarily the, the worst of the perpetrators, but allow for individuals who might find themselves stumbling into that system with a more benevolent chance at having a second shot. Um, redemption for society is a really tough, big question. Um, how are we, how, I mean, I, I was, how are we going to redeem ourselves in the eyes of the world when this country that once stood for rule of law and human rights and we were, this was a, a basic foreign policy cornerstone for Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, for Republicans and Democrats alike. How are we ever going to redeem <coughs> our moral standing to look a nation squarely in the eye and say you're torturing Stop it. And they say, yeah, but you're torturing. You tortured, so who the hell are you to tell me? And that question of how you redeem the moral high ground is a really challenging one for us as a people to look, for, to look going forward. That's probably going to be your generation's work. Our generation's work is probably going to be trying to clean up the mess. Um, look, Ben, I think on the question of criminal immigrants, I, I think, you know, by, I'm not saying there's only one strategy or one, one message, but where's Ben? I'm not, there's not one strategy, there's not one message point, there's not what happens, I think you're exactly right with criminal immigrants, I think part of what's so problematic about the Arizona law is that it, it, it criminalizes mere status as opposed to conduct. And that we've always had this artifice, you know this, but I'm just speaking to, to other folks, you, we've always had this artifice that if you were here illegally, that wasn't a crime. That was just an administrative violation. But if you committed a crime when you're here illegally, then that, that would allow the government to deport you. Um, I think for the fact there, the, the, the chance of redemption is, you know, they, so they screwed it up, but did they have enough of a contribution to society? You know, were they on the pathway to being fully incorporated into American society? Did they contribute already or have more to contribute? Those arguments, I think, are not going to play out much in a court of law. I think you have to, in your clinic, you have to fight it, you know, and the judges will look at competing equities, but they have less and less discretion over time, as I understand. It's been years since I've done that type of work. So, but I do think that one of the things is happening is that as more and more, what I believe, what more and more of the human narratives get told, when people say, well, come on, this doesn't sound right or fair. Because so much of the immigration debate is kind of nameless, faceless, not understandable in a way that often it's really easy for people to just imagine hordes of people who are here without proper papers who might do us harm. And yet when they know more about the, the, some of the real people who are here and find themselves in this situation, um, changing that public debate I think is going to be an important one. And the, of course you're going to find the... Republicans, especially the far right wing, not necessarily uh, Senator Graham, but others who are against the rep immigration reform, 
are going to pick the Willie Horton examples in the immigrant community, and those are going to be their poster boys. And unless we have our own poster boys and poster girls, if you answer poster boys that you can kind of picture the person, tell the story with platitudes and with numbers and with legal arguments, you'll lose. And so I think part of what we've got to do is find our own standard bearers to make that case, I think, as best and the most as effective as possible on a macro level. On a case-by-case -case level, I throw everything you can in a case. Any, any legal argument you can, throw it in. Um, play for time. And you hope that there's an amnesty law that's enacted in the time that your client's still in the country. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, Nathaniel last, because I want to wrap up with that question. Uh, Rafael's question. You know, I think, I, think you're, I think you're all right to be very uh, suspicious and pushing back and agnostic, at least, about the use of a redemption as a theme to organize uh, a different type of debate. That's why I'm trying it on you, so you can help me figure it out. Um, at the same time, I think that one of the things we can't, we can't just assume that the current context, where is it, where is it? Ah, we can't, Rafael, we can't assume that the current context, the current status quo is where we'll always be. You know, on a very different level, just because you, you say, you know, there's, it's a country that's proven to be, or more prone to be authoritarian, and so it's so hard to deal with questions like tasers or, uh, or, you know, the kid got what they deserved and she was scribbling on the desk. You know, I think actually public attitudes move remarkably well if you have the, the ability, if you have the right communicators, if you have the tenacity, if you have the resonance. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, people, the, for all of the, the, the vitriol of the Tea Party, which there is enormous racism and homophobia there, most of America finds it disgusting, right? Most of America finds it appalling that you'd spit on John Lewis or call Barney Frank a faggot. Almost everyone recoils at that. A couple people you know, don't recoil at it, and a couple of political leaders don't condemn them. Those are the ones who got to get hauled outside the woodshed. But most Americans have a trouble with that. That wasn't where we were 50 years ago. Uh, it wasn't where we were 20 years ago when I was a kid. You know, the word faggot, you know, was that a problem for most people? No. I mean, this, the way the social mores have changed, um, I think in some ways the law is behind the public on some key issues like gay rights rather than you know, reflective of public sentiment. And so I think to the extent in which we do see very strong authoritarian streaks in our society and we do see the kind of the erosion of some of the key checks and balances, some of the stuff I was talking to you about, whether it's the war on terror or the criminal justice system. Um, but I don't think it's a place where we're going to stay for all that long because uh, I have to be the eternal optimist. It's hard to go to work otherwise. Um, Nathaniel, uh, this is what I love about it. Uh, the undergrads are the greatest because they're still, they're still sorting out it at the highest levels, really. Um, how Obama answers this debate has to be you know, carefully from a more practical, realpolitik approach has to be very carefully uh, uh, crafted. I'm not sure. I'm not in those circles, so I can't tell you what they are or aren't doing. I could tell you what I would do if I had them in a, you know, in a, on a train with me. I mean, you have to find the right messengers. You need, you need some bulldogs. You need to go after some of the most acidic, I would say, I don't even say acidic, I would say caustic, I would say, you know, <laughs> Uh, statements and you need to have you know dog to dog you know pit bull to pit bull and that should not be coming from the president um, I think you need to have people who are going to be the peacemakers on both sides people who are who are kind of leaders of the constituency that supports the Tea Party who reach out and say you know this is just unacceptable for these following reasons I think also that we need to have the debate about it, which I, this is one thing that I feel good about. I wouldn't want to shut up the, the vitriol. I want to answer the vitriol. I want to drown it out. I want to make it so 
unpalatable for you to actually call Barney Frank a faggot, that you're going to have to scream that in the quiet of your home rather than on the street corner because we're going to be louder than you. Because for me, I'd rather do that than kind of have any type of legislative effort that curbs the ability to want to express themselves. And I think, frankly, the president, and this is where I'll take a leap of faith in my personal view, is just like a, an acidic Obama. You know, are we crazy? You know, you've never seen a cooler president. You know, how about George Bush the first? You want to talk about acidic? Pull up the clip. I don't even know if it's on YouTube. The old guy was not bef around before YouTube. You know, when he, when he condemned Michael Dukakis, I'm not a card-carrying member and I will never be one. I swear to God, I'm imitating him, but I've seen that clip a thousand times. That is not acidic. Look at Ronald Reagan, for Christ's sake. Was, look at some of these, some of the most effective presidents of the Republican Party. Uh, Nixon, before even he was brought to shame. And so I'm not, I, I think we have to ask ourselves, why is it that our first African-American president is being labeled with a kind of a label that has, could have been used on many other presidents long before him? And it has a lot to do with the fact that there are, it's a dog whistle phrase. You know, I hear them criticize Obama as acidic. I'm like, okay, well, I have to hear the speech. You know, a white supremacist, supremacist hears, you know, Obama's acidic. They're hearing Muslim. They're hearing un-American. The birthers will say non-American citizen. And so I think much of the language that's been used around this presidency is especially racially charged. And I think one of the hard things that he has to do is it's harder for him, to him, for him to engage that without looking like he's playing a card. He can't. I mean, it would be a disaster if he ever tried to have this type of conversation. But I think there is a different way in which, I mean, I, I'm sure we've criticized, you know, we as a society, I'm sure the ACLU criticized Bush and Reagan. I'm not sure we ever bothered to complain about their tone. You know, Sidney is the last of it. You know, it's just like, you know, however they said it, that what they were doing was pretty bad. But it's kind of interesting that in this context, it's not just the policies, but it's also the, the, it's also the form and the substance, which seems to be a, a part of the, of the subject matter. I will say this to you. So you go to your exams. You go on to your internships at Lambda Legal or elsewhere, some of the ACLU interns I came up with in the office. But I want you to do, or you go off on vacation, or you go off and work and I didn't work in an internship. I worked in the hotel my father worked at every summer. I was a room service waiter, a busboy, you know, dining room waiter, you, you named it, where, a bellhop. Um, but wherever you work, the most important thing is you've got to remain engaged. That it's too easy to look at these issues and think, I don't know enough. I'm kind of busy. I'm tired of this. Won't they stop with this already? And I'm not saying spend the rest of your lives you know, focusing on this. But these issues about what is at play in our society and what forces are drawing us either to be a better society for good or a society for a few that's very good have to be the issues that you deal with in your lives. And whether you go on to build businesses or you go on to work on very important court cases or you go on to an investment bank or You've got to remain focused on these issues because the one thing that America must never be is a quiet place. It's got to be a cacophony of voices. It's got to be a, a, a multiplicity of perspectives. It can never be left to the purview, the purview of the pundits and politicians and lawyers and lobbyists. It's got to be in the heart and soul of the people who live our aspirations and have to make them real. And that's why it's always great to come to NYU and to speak to you. And I thank you very much. My email is aromero at aclu.org. I, I do answer my emails. Karen will tell you. Magogadi will tell you. It takes me a little bit of time. But um, do email me and do stay focused. And good luck with the exams and enjoy the weather. You can study outside. some great weather. So I look forward to uh, seeing you afterwards. Take care. Thank you.
on behalf of the Reynolds program, I want to again thank Anthony for coming, sharing his wisdom, and I want to thank all of you for coming as well. Uh, to keep staying engaged in these issues, we encourage you to check out the Reynolds blog. Anthony has a recent post that you can read and respond to. Um, also, in August, you can check our website. We'll have the next lineup of speakers for next year. And this concludes the speaker series for this year. Thank you for coming. Thank you.